sitting all day is not the answer to life's great questions. Even if you're sitting in cool, flexible seating or admiring the most epic bulletin boards or having a wide-eyed, leaning-in, wowza, kapowza kind of discussion. The school day is long, and we all need a chance to stretch and move and talk to stay awake and interested in what's going on. So, time to integrate yoga and Tai Bo into your daily ELA lessons? Well, no, probably not. Luckily, there are a lot of lovely ways to help students get up and get moving in your classroom while staying true to what you want to teach. Today, in episode 162, we'll be diving into 11 of them. Are you ready? Hey there, I'm your host, Betsy Potash, and one-pagers, project-based learning, and choice reading are my jam. I believe in you, and my goal is to help you explore all the creative possibilities you dream of for your classroom. I'm an educator, a chocolate cake aficionado, a traveler who can't wait to get back to Barcelona, and the kind of mom who brings her own mini maker space to her kid's classroom when she comes to volunteer. I know this for sure, creativity isn't always easy. As a creative teacher, you get parent calls you treasure, and plenty of sidelong comments you'd rather forget. But here's the bottom line. Creative education can ignite a spark in your students and change their lives forever. You and I know this. You're an innovator. And while it's sometimes hard, it's so worth it. So let's explore the world of creative education together. Welcome to the Spark Creativity Teacher Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Kind Cotton, a small family-owned business changing the world one book at a time. When you purchase one of their lovely teacher tees or sweatshirts, they donate one inclusive children's book, and they're almost up to 80,000 books. You can use my affiliate code Betsy for 10% off your next purchase at kindcotton.com. Okay, here we go. Our first strategy for getting students out of their seats is to try stations. Stations are really one of my favorite ways to teach. They let kids move around at their own pace. They offer you a chance to get in there and work with small groups or individuals much more easily. And also you can cover really almost anything with them. Once you get into the mindset of thinking about how to break up a topic into smaller stations, it becomes quite second nature. So let's look at an example. Let's think about a sit in your seat lesson plan and then how we might adapt it into station. So for example, a common thing to be doing in English class is to have students editing their writing drafts. So one way to do this is to have them all kind of sitting with their device and going through and self-editing, maybe using a checklist that you give them. And then after 15 minutes of that, having them trade with a partner or maybe two partners to provide feedback, inserting comments, um, maybe even having a conversation with their peer. And then after maybe 20 minutes of that, they're going to start to rewrite. So in that lesson plan, which is action-packed with important things, students are basically just sitting in their seat the whole time. Now you can do something very similar Um, in a station format that has them getting up, moving around every little while, and thus just kind of shaking it up, (laughs) helping them um, kind of stay awake to the situation. So for example, you want to accomplish the same thing through stations. You can have one station where they can self-edit. So when they go to that station, they'll take a look at a checklist, um, just like they would if they were sitting in their seat. But you could also have some other resources there, maybe a citation guide, maybe some models of really good papers from the year before with some labeled parts that would help them see what the papers are modeling, what makes the papers effective. And now they're kind of like looking around at that station, at that table, thinking about their paper and in that certain lens. And when they feel like they've done enough, even if it doesn't take 15 minutes or maybe if it takes 25 minutes depending on the kid, then they go on to a different station, the one that they feel drawn to next. Maybe next they go to the peer swap and at that station they're going to focus entirely on the grammar and spelling of their peer. And there's a poster there that sort of has common errors to look for. So they sit down, they find a friend, they switch, they sort of look over the common error sheet, they do some marking, they trade back. Then they're looking around, what should they do next? Oh, they go to the peer conversation station. So they walk across the room, they find another person to trade with, they go through a list of questions to talk about their papers. Um, 
it's the same lesson, right? Except they're they're moving around the room. They're going in the order that they want to. It feels more varied. It, it feels a little more exciting. And then at the same time that they're doing all this, you can be running a station that's optional where students can come to meet with you for help. Um, because it's quite an active environment, everyone's moving around, it's pretty easy for you to get in there and help students who might be struggling with their paper. So that's one way to translate um, a sitting down lesson into stations, but there are so many ways to use stations. You can use it um, for different types of reading students might be doing, for different types of annotation. You can be doing it for, for project work, different types of poetry activities, Um, different ways to analyze or react to a short story. I really think once you start to think about it, stations are not only quite fun to set up, but they're really pretty easy to set up once once again you're in that mindset. Okay, number two. This is is a really active way to do class. It's something I'm not going to suggest you do all the time because it's a lot of work, but it's so much fun, and that is to dive into escape rooms. Escape rooms definitely get students out of their seats and pretty much keep them there <laughs> throughout throughout the class. So maybe they're with a partner or they're with a group and they're going to be going around exploring different puzzles and clues relating to your content that are all around the room. If you've never done an escape room before, I'd suggest you look back a little bit. I, I put out a lot of escape room how-tos and frequently asked questions last fall at this time. And I created a lot of escape rooms and created some um, escape room resources for you. And what I would say after doing all that is that, yeah, escape rooms are not an everyday sort of experience. It's very immersive. It takes time to design one. It takes time to set it up. But then it becomes like this super special thing that you can return to year after year. So whether you take you know, an entire professional development day sometime to create one, maybe with a friend, or you buy one, it's just something that you have in your back pocket as this like boom day, (laughs) really exciting, fun day that you look forward to that's memorable, that your students probably tell about to other students that are incoming to your class, oh, wait till you try this, it's so crazy, Um, and that's really meaningful. Okay, number three, take a listening activity outside. So I design a lot of podcasting curriculum, as you may know, and I often build in models for students to listen to. So if they're going to design, say, a vocabulary podcast, I'm going to have them listen to a bunch of other versions of vocabulary podcasts before they try to design their own So if you're doing some podcasting curriculum or if you're doing podcast clubs or you just want students to listen to a podcast or a chapter of an audio book or a a TED Talk, just the audio, something like that, you can actually go outside to do that. If your students have earbuds and they have devices, I love this idea. It was was one of the members of my Lighthouse community that first suggested it to me. She was taking her students outside to do one of my podcast activities, and she said they just walked around the track in the sunshine listening and getting ideas for their own podcast, and that when they came back in, they were so excited um, about the project, and it just made me think, wow, yeah, on a beautiful day when everyone wants to be outside, just go walk, (laughs) go listen, or even just kind of spread out in the sun and, and sit for 10 minutes outside instead of in the classroom. Okay, number four, try collaborative annotation posters. So if you're trying to find a way to make annotation more fun, this is a solid way to do that and get students out of their seats. The idea is pretty simple. You put text up big on your wall. So whether you print it out on a big poster size or you just write it up on butcher paper or you ask students to write it or you write it really big on your whiteboard a couple of times for different groups or you have the kids write it up on the whiteboard and the chalkboard and butcher paper all over your room. The idea is you have these large texts and then you invite students to do um, certain steps of annotating. So maybe you have them draw symbols into the margins and you have them use a color to mark all the rhyme and you have them um, isolate different literary devices and explain them and you have them add post-its that define crucial vocabulary words 
et cetera, et cetera. And so they're working, they're standing up, they're reading and rereading the text, they're discussing it, they're trying to hit all the bullet points that you've suggested and maybe add some more insight of their own. And, and it, it becomes this cool thing. They're basically designing like a museum exhibit of the text in large um, font on your wall. And then they can take, around, take a, a walk around and look at each other's. Number five, performance. There are so many ways to build performance into your classroom. You've probably heard my story that I once applied for a, a very small community grant. I think, honestly, I think it was a $100 grant. And I was so excited when I got it because I had applied to create a theater corner in my classroom. And I just wanted to go to Goodwill and buy a bunch of fun stuff. I wanted to buy wigs and costume jewelry and sunglasses and suit coats and sparkly dresses and you know, candlesticks and just all this crazy stuff and organize it in the corner of my classroom so that when we did different theater things, we actually had some props. And I found that it made a huge difference. And so I really recommend this idea of a, of a few props in a box or on a shelf closet in your room. But even if you don't have props, there's so many ways to spin a little bit of theater into your classroom. One way to do it is at the end of a reading, at the end of a text, or even just a chapter or an act of a play, have students perform lightning versions of it. So put them in groups and ask them to create a script for like a one minute version of the text. Um, that's really fun. Another option is to do class scenes from plays. If you're reading any type of play, you can have students be standing up and acting it out. Um, you can do a full class play performance. We've talked about that here on the podcast before. That's like a full on <laughs> reader's theater experience. If you want to really devote like a month to performance, your students will be out of their seat a lot, but you can also do this in very small ways just for, just for 20 minutes of acting or 10 minutes. Um, and it's a great way to have students up and out of their chairs. Okay, number six, explore the writing maker space. You know how I feel about Angela Stockman's amazing concept of the writing maker space. <laughs> I love it. I, I'm proud. Um, when you help students use maker materials to explore their writing ideas, it can really help them cut down on writer's block. It can get them out of their seats. It can get them thinking about writing in new ways to feel less intimidated by writing. So let's look at some examples. Maybe you invite your students all to take some post-its and absolutely cover your whiteboard and post-its describing tastes. Okay, this is like a super simple way to incorporate a little bit of this idea of making before you write. So now your students are walking down the side of your classroom, taking in all of these taste descriptions, and then you ask them to do some writing on a prompt that relates to taste. After seeing, after writing, after after maybe arranging these post-its into little themed clumps or whatever, they've really physically um, created a, a, a pre-structure for their writing. Maybe you bring in popsicle sticks, paper, markers, and googly eyes and invite each student to create a puppet in three minutes. This doesn't have to be like this huge art project. Just give them a couple minutes to create a goofy puppet and then put them with a partner or put them in a small group and say like, introduce your puppet. <laughs> What's their name? What sport do they like? What's their favorite food? Kind of like explain to each other the personality of your puppet and they'll think it's ridiculous at first, and then they'll think it's funny, and then they'll start saying things like, well, my puppet's actually training for the Olympics. And then you can have them write dialogue. Maybe you're practicing, you know, quotation marks and the use of said versus snipe to versus screamed, and you want them to be practicing these things. Start with puppets, and then have them create a dialogue between the puppets that they've created. Here's another idea. Put loose parts out. Loose parts can be anything. Any random little supplies that you have at home. It could be it could be something fancy like Legos, but it could also be something like rocks. <laughs> and then, you know, with a few different loose parts, ask students to build an idea for an argument. Angela often references the day she invited students to build something in response to the prompt, what is unfair? And my first thought is like, how are students going to 
create an answer to what is unfair out of loose parts. But what actually happened is that the students immediately went to work and even asked her for more materials. They they were so focused on creating sort of the structure, the ideas of their response to what is unfair. And then once once they've built these concepts, they know what represents what. They know kind of do they have a three-part argument in what they've built? Do they have a two-part? Is one part a story and one part is a bunch of facts? And then they can go, they can take a picture of what they've made or they can just sit by it and start to write. Um, It's kind of amazing. (laughs) All right, number seven, experiment with hexagonal thinking. Hexagonal thinking helps students think critically about different themes. I'm not going to go into full depth on how it works, but if you haven't tried hexagonal thinking, then definitely check out my blog over at Spark Creativity for more. You can just search Spark Creativity plus hexagonal thinking and you will get lots of (laughs) visual examples and you can find the free digital toolkit and everything else. But Hexagonal thinking really helps students practice their critical thinking, their argument, improving their group dynamics. There's a lot of things to like about it, but it's also a great way to change up the physical feel of the class because you're giving them all these papers to move around. You're bringing them into groups. You can let them spread out across your classroom floor or your hallway, and they're moving around these cards as they construct a web of linking ideas. You can also give them tape or put magnets on the back of your hexagons and have them taping them on the wall or moving them around some sort of large magnetic surface that you have. Um, it's a great way to sort of make thinking tangible um, and, and have students really interacting with their own ideas in a physical way. Okay, number eight, try rotating circles. <laughs> no, I know you probably have no idea what I'm talking about when I say rotating circles, but this is actually one of my favorite teaching strategies. I relied on this a lot. When I was in graduate school at the Breadloaf School of English, I took this really magical course called Discovering the Imagination. It was just as great as <laughs> you're probably thinking that it was. One of our texts was Paulo Freire's book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and I'm pretty sure that's where I first stumbled on this idea of rotating circles, though I don't think it was actually named that. But it was like 15 years ago, and I, I'm not hundred percent sure, but here's how it works. And there are a million ways you can use it in class. You have your students stand up and create an inner circle and an outer circle. So if your classroom is really full and you don't have room to do this, you can go outside or you can go in the hallway, or you can just try to work with your desks, (laughs) or you can say, you know, let's take one minute and shove all the desks to the side and, and then make this inner and outer circle. Each person in the inner circle should be facing one person in the outer circle. They're going to do some kind of activity with the person that they're facing in the outer circle, and then you are going to say rotate, and either just the inner circle rotates one person to the left, or just the outer circle rotates one person in either direction, or they, or they both rotate. And you can keep rotating them as many times as you want, um, and they will just keep having new partners up to a point until they get back to their original partner. Now, I've used this in so many ways. You can you can just have them discuss a question. Maybe you have some big crucial question on the board and you want students to practice making their arguments. So they they discuss it with the person across from them. One person gives their perspective, the other person gives their perspective, and then they rotate. Now maybe they have kind of a different idea about it because they've just heard from somebody else and they have a conversation again. And then they rotate again and you go, go, go. Maybe you throw out a new question after a while. Maybe they're going to look at the person across from them and share a short piece of writing they've just completed and get one tip back from the other person and one compliment. Or maybe they've just created a word wall poster with a vocabulary word and they're going to present it to their partner as a way to quickly review the word and then hear from the partner to quickly review that word and then they're going to rotate and review the next word and rotate and review the next word. Maybe they're going to practice a performance poem or like a short speech that they're going to be giving to the whole class and they're going to practice it just for that one person 
for two minutes and then they're going to rotate and practice for a new person for two minutes <laughs> and slowly by repeating it over and over they're going to build confidence and they're going to feel a little less nervous and they're going to know that half the class already knows what they're talking about and maybe it'll feel a little less intimidating to give the speech or the poem to the whole class. Again, I could go on. <laughs> there are a lot of ways to use this and I've used a lot of them, and I hope that you will too. It's it's really one of my favorite tools, and it really does help like the after lunch lethargy or the first period exhaustion that can come up with, with even the best classes. All right, number nine, invite gallery walks. This strategy is so fundamental to me that I almost forgot to include it in this list. It's an essential part of, of helping students get out of their seats and, and see each other's work and appreciate each other's work. You can include it practically every day, just for 30 seconds. For example, maybe you've tried out sketch notes with your students, but they're kind of struggling. They, they sort of get the idea of sketch notes and they're sort of like, why are we doing this? But some of the students really have it down. And some students even that are struggling did like one part of their notes that's so cool. So maybe you have them all turn their notebooks facing out and stand up and take 30 seconds to walk around and see how other people are doing sketch notes. Maybe your students just created blackout poetry. They spent 40 minutes, they made these beautiful poems. Instead of just turning them into you, let them all tape their work to the walls for the last three minutes of class and walk around and see each other's work. Maybe your students just filmed one minute videos during class, argument videos. I think you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Maybe they can all put their iPads up on their desks and walk around and see each other's videos. Now, if your gallery walk is going to be longish, longer than a few minutes, and you're worried that your students might not stay focused, you can ask them to complete some kind of feedback task during a gallery walk. I know it can be a little tricky when you just let students loose to walk around the classroom. If you don't quite trust them to stay on task, you can say something really simple like, Put two post-its on work that impresses you and, you know, give them a compliment. Or it can be something a little more complex like, you know, vote for the award for the best film. Which film do you think makes its argument most effectively along these guidelines and hand everybody a ballot? So they look at all the videos that they can in the time they have and then they go back and kind of write a, a ballot post for one. Okay, number 10 the speed round. So I wasn't exactly sure what to call this because you can do so many different things. I've heard of speed dating a book. I've heard of speed debating. You could do speed argument. Here, here's the basic structure. You're going to line desks up facing each other or maybe tables facing each other, depending on your classroom. And at each place, you're either going to have a chair on one side and a chair on the other. So two students will be facing each other across the table or the desk, or you can have a chair on one side and then some thing over on the other side, like a book or a writing prompt. So you are going to have the students all spread out around the, the desks, whether they're either face to face with each other or all along one side, and they will do the speed activity at their table until you say switch, so, or until you play some kind of fun timer or sound effect. Now, for example, let's say you're doing speed dating a book. So at every little station, there's going to be a book and every student is going to know they only have one minute to look at the book and they're trying to maybe write down five that they want to read from your library or something like that. So they get to their station. They have only one minute. It's very frenzied. <laughs> they need to look at the front and back cover, maybe check out the review quotes, read the first sentence, that kind of thing, just like as quickly as they can. They're trying to get a sense of the book, write it down if they want to read it, and then immediately they're going to hear that sound effect that means switch, and they're going to be getting up and going on to the next. Or let's say you just want students to practice the skill of quickly coming up with an argument. So they're going to get to a desk, face a prompt, and have two minutes to respond with just like their position and a couple sentences to support it. Boom. They can't think very much. They just quickly write some kind of an argument, go on to the next station, speed argument. They do it again and again and again and get lots of practice just sort of overcoming their writer's block and writing something. Now you can probably think of lots of other ways to use this concept of speed, but it just definitely adds movement and excitement to whatever you're wanting to do. 
All right, last but not least, I was going to go for an even 10 on this one, but I just couldn't leave out the silent discussion because it's absolutely one of my favorite strategies for helping students participate in class conversation. I think we've all had that class where there are three or four kids that just get in to every verbal discussion. Their hand is always up or in more of a Harkness style. They're, they just always jump in and fill the silence. And maybe you've got 20 other students who are very quiet and there could be a million reasons for that. And of course, they they have a lot to contribute. And so what I like about the silent discussion, it helps those really verbal kids see the strengths and the things that that maybe the kids who aren't jumping into every silence have to contribute, which can be very meaningful in group dynamics. And it helps those kids who like to think about things before they jump into the fray or who maybe just don't want to be um, participating aloud for for a range of reasons to, to get in there and get to share their ideas. And so I, I really love it. So one way to do it that really gets kids up and out of their seats is to put prompts all over your room. It can be on groups of tables. It can be taped up on the wall. It can be on giant sheets of butcher paper. Um, and then you're going to ask students to start to wander explore the questions and respond. So if they're on giant sheets of butcher paper or on your whiteboards and chalkboards, students can just write right on there. If they're just on pieces of paper at different stations and walls, you can give them post-its. And basically they will respond to some questions. At some, at some questions, there will already be a lot of responses. They can read those responses and they can add their own responses to the responses. And so slowly... Um, the conversation around each prompt becomes more complex as more things have been said. Now you can leave it at that and just let the silent discussion stand, or you can use it as a segue into a verbal conversation. Because at that point, everybody's thought about these questions, everybody's responded, everybody's read other people's responses, and you're going to have a conversation that flows more easily and with more depth. And often you're going to see more students comfortable to participate because they've already prepared some ideas for what they want to say. So if you if you invite somebody to get the ball rolling, you might find that you have more hands um, or just more people willing to jump in because they are prepared. Okay, you guys, that was a lot. <laughs> this is a longish episode. So let's review our 11 get out of your seats activities. We've got stations. We've got escape rooms. We've got taking a listening activity outside. We've got collaborative annotation posters, class performances in a range of different lengths and styles, makerspace activities, love those, hexagonal thinking, love that, Rotating circles, my interpretation of Paulo Freire's awesome strategy, gallery walks, speed dating or debating or argument, and silent discussion. I really hope one of those feels exciting and interesting to you and you feel like you want to give it a try in your classroom. Thanks for joining me today. If you're just tuning in here at the Spark Creativity Teacher Podcast for the first time, I hope you'll peek backward in the queue and see if there's another topic to inspire you on your next commute or morning walk. Welcome to the show. If you're a longtime listener, honestly, I'm honored. Thank you for letting me share ideas with you week in and week out. Until next time, take care of yourself and stay creative.